Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Change is one constant in our lives, but climate change is disconcerting. What are the impacts of a warmer, wetter future, and how can Vermonters best prepare for it? UVM researchers are working on these questions with the Vermont Climate Change Assessment Project. Two researchers will join me today, but first here's a brief video about their study. The Vermont Climate Assessment is a state level assessment of the impacts of climate change and it really focuses on how climate is impacting Vermonters and how we can better prepare for the future. This research provides information that empowers local decisions. It's really hard to make decisions when you think about a global trend in climate change or even a national or regional trend, but understanding what is happening within the state of Vermont is information people can use to make a decision. For me, the important piece is to always continue to grow that understanding and knowledge of what the current and, and latest science looks like so that we can make informed decisions. And so it can range anywhere from working with K through 12 teachers and students to legislators and providing statistics, understanding, interpretations of what weather and climate and climate change look like for them. When I talk to stakeholders about agriculture, climate change has been impacting farms um, for much longer than the general public has even acknowledged that climate change is happening. They are a, a very resilient people um, by nature. Um, they're used to adapting to things, so they're not af afraid of impacts in, in general. These data in this assessment are incredibly important for developing their programs so that they fit with what is expected to be coming down the road um, in terms of the, the effects of climate change on our farms. We cannot think about climate change all alone. And so we're also really seeking input from the diversity of voices in Vermont and around Vermont who are concerned or impacted by climate change. So please reach out or put us in touch with those people. Okay. Well, you met Jillian Galford and Joshua Faulkner in the video, and I'm delighted that, uh, to have them join us here today by Zoom. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jillian, the results of the study won't be completed until this summer, even though you're still collecting some data. But what, what do you hope to achieve with the assessment? Yeah, the Vermont Climate Assessment is to provide information on climate change that matters in Vermont and to Vermonters. So what's happening, what's impacting us, can we prepare for risks and opportunities under climate change? And often um, climate change is hard to understand or hard to relate to because we talk about it on very global scales. So the purpose of this project is to really digest and understand the issues and experiences that matter to Vermonters. Okay, so what are the significant signs of climate change that we're experiencing in Vermont? Yeah, so in Vermont, we know that temperature and precipitation have been increasing, you know, and there's statistics like the average temperature in Vermont has increased over a degree since 1960, but much of this change in temperature has come since 1990. About half of it has come just in the last couple of decades. Um, but these numbers, Fran, are to me a little hard to digest because it's not uniform. It's not like temperature increases every day of every year. Um, in fact, what we see is that nighttime temperatures are increasing more rapidly than other hmm. parts of the, the um, day. And especially in winter, we're seeing nighttime temperatures go up. And if you think about the beautiful winter weather we're having this year, um, you know, this increased winter overnight temperatures can actually have an impact on our snowpack. Oh. Um, which is concerning if you like being out in the snow in the winter. But precipitation is really interesting. It's hard to get your brain around it a little bit because what we're seeing is a lot of variability. Mm. So overall, precipitation is increasing. Uh, we're getting more precipitation, but it's coming in big storms. It's not like a few more raindrops every day. Um, it's coming in these really big storms. Rutland, for example, got um, about four days per year of extreme precipitation in the 1960s and 1970s. Hmm. And today it's getting 10 to 12 days of extreme precipitation. So it is going and, up over time, certainly. Yeah. yeah. And in some years like 2020, we saw prolonged dry spells, which can have... Hmm the opposite effect, too little water. Right. Uh, so, so Josh, you're as the lead on 
agricultural impacts. Um, what are you focused on that affects farmers? You know, you talk about them as resilient, but this this stuff is tough. It it is tough. Um, I think there are two primary um, impacts of climate change that farmers are, are dealing with. One is the, just the unpredictability. Um, there's really no more normal growing season, no more normal May, normal September. Um, farmers really need to be prepared for a wide range of conditions at any point um, within within the year. And the other factor is, is exactly what, what Jillian spoke about, and that's the change in their moisture patterns and our moisture extremes. Um, we're seeing more events that could lead to flooding, which has, has impacts on those farms with um, that have crops in the floodplain. And these, these floodplain soils are really important. They're, they're the most fertile soils we have in the state and really important for vegetables and specialty crops that we want to encourage for a local food system. Uh, these moisture extremes also lead to a lot of soil erosion, which is really tragic. That's, that's the foundation of the farm is their soils. And so when we lose these soils due to these events, um, it, it's, it's difficult to build back. And there are a, a variety of other impacts, soil compaction and saturated soils impacting crops, it, but the moisture extremes are probably the most challenging for the farmers. And also lead to more disease in crops. It's harder for the, for the crops. Uh, yeah. that, that's exactly right. Farmers are, are using things like hot tunnels to try to shelter their crops from um, uh, uh, the, the really wet conditions. Those, those mm -hmm. breed disease. And that is one of the, the um, I think, hot points of a dry summer is there's less disease, but it's really challenging then to get water to crops. Um, but, but it does lead to less disease. All right. So, and Jillian, you've engaged your public in the, in the study. Um, how did that work out? And what are people saying concerns the most? What are they noticing? Yeah, so we work with people around the state to um, try and address their concerns and needs when it comes to climate information. And, you know, this is everything agriculture and food systems to community development, recreation and tourism, infrastructure, public health. So we do really want to hear from people about what they need um, to know about. Um, and what I've found really exciting is that we hear from people sometimes who have local records. So this might be a journal or a logbook that you've kept for 30 years. Um, and maybe if we look at it, we might actually find out there's a climate signal in this. So right. we like this, this farm. I'm sorry, go ahead, but we have this chart of the, of the uh, apple farm and they, that's yeah, came from so that. we worked with Allen Home Farm in 2012 um, and Ray Allen had been recording uh, a lot of the phenological events on his uh, apple orchard. Mm -hmm. So dates when leaves came out, dates when the uh, trees bloomed and so on. So we were able to take the date of the Macintosh apple bloom and look at how it had changed over time. Um, and in fact, we see that it is bloom the, his trees in 2012 were blooming about five or six days earlier than they had been in, in 19, early 1970s when he started taking the record. Hmm. Um, and we actually see that this corresponds really well to the the trends in climate for South Hero, where that farm is located. Fantastic. And um, for other people that, that might have some information to share with you, we'll get to that at, at the end. You know, stay tuned for that um, address. So quickly, how can your data help decision makers and, and citizens? Um, you know, is that already happening? Are they waiting for your information? Yeah, our, our work is meant to su support uh, decisions from the state level to the local level. And one example is Vermont has um, just founded the Vermont Climate Council, and they are charged with making some new climate policy. Um, and we'll really need this type of information on climate change to make the best decisions. Great. And Josh, how is your data helping farmers? And, and, uh, and what are they doing now, actually, to deal with climate change? I think it's very useful for farmers in terms of their long range planning, um, where they make investments on the farm, whether they're trying to um, put their money into uh, more resilient systems because of flooding or because of drought, uh, irrigation systems, things like that. It's so much more useful than data at the national scale, which is what 
most of us see more often. And so this Vermont specific data is really useful for them and for the agencies that support the farms, they, um, agencies like the NRCS and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets so that they can tailor their programs and policies um, for the expected impacts of, of climate change. Fantastic. And we're just seeing quickly the, the, the growing seasons have changed over time, right? They, they have, and this is a great example of Vermont sourced data from weather stations all around uh, Vermont. And you can see that there's been a, a steady increase. In some cases, it bounces around a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's typical with climate change. Um, but overall, it's about 3.7 days per decade. Um, that, that's the rate of, of the increase of the growing season. And so if there is one silver lining to climate change, this, this may be it, that we may be able to grow crops that are more typical of the mid-Atlantic in the future. Oh, opportunities also. <laughs> so the, the assessment uh, will give uh, data needed, needed by farmers and policymakers uh, for, to make informed decisions. Uh, Jillian, who else might benefit from this, this study? Yeah, I think it's an opportunity for all of us to learn um, about what's happening with climate change in Vermont. I always like to say Vermonters are incredibly in touch with the world outside their window. Mm -hmm. They understand a lot about the natural world and the landscape. Um, and observe a lot of these changes. So sometimes actually showing this information for the state reinforces something that you might have already observed in your neighborhood out, out your window, looking at the apple tree in your yard, for example. Um, so everybody from state policymakers to individuals who are interested to learn more and be empowered um, to address climate change. Fantastic. Uh, Jillian and Joshua, you, uh, this assessment is very exciting and it's great that you're bringing everybody's um, observations because the Vermonters are very observant. And if you want to participate, um, you can or, or even donate to the assessment. There are links. Um, here they are. Uh, at You can go to go.uvm.edu slash vtclimate. Uh, and Jillian and Joshua are still um, asking for uh, some information to still come in. I think it's very exciting. The study will be out in the summer, so maybe we'll have you back to find out um, how you, what you've assessed at that time. Jillian and Joshua, thank you so much for everything that you do and for joining me today. Thank you. Thanks, Fran. And thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard, stay well.